In PixInsight, there are a number of scripts that we can use to analyze our image, fine-tune our equipment, and optimize our observations. The Image Analysis section contains various scripts for visual and numerical analysis of images. We can use these two scripts, Aberration Inspector and Aberration Spotter, to visually analyze any aberrations in our optical system. Let's open Aberration Inspector. This script generates a mosaic of our chosen site. By default, it generates a 3x3 three three panel mosaic of subsections of the image, the center, the top, bottom, left, and right, and then the four corners. In other words, we can compare the shape of the stars in the center of the image with the ones on the edges. We can do the same with Aberration Spotter, but by default this tool creates a mosaic where we can only see the center and the four corners. One advantage of this script is that the panels can be rectangular. This is very useful if you use an ultra-wide monitor. Aberration Spotter doesn't apply a stretch to the image, so we always need to press Ctrl A. In this image, we can see that the stars are correct in the center and on the left, but there is some astigmatism on the right. With Aberration Inspector, the mosaic generated will always be square. This script does apply a stretch to the image. The advantage of this script is that we don't just see the corners and the center, but also areas on the left and right, and at the top and bottom. Here we have a 3x3 three three panel. We can increase the size of the mosaic, but it will always be square. What we're doing here is a visual inspection of the image, but we can also quantify the shape and size of the stars throughout the focal plane. We can do this using FWHM Eccentricity, which analyzes the size and eccentricity of the stars. If we click on Measure, it detects and measures the stars in the image. Here we have the median size of the stars and the median eccentricity. If we click on Support, it generates three images. The first one is of the stars detected in the image, and the second and third are maps. These confirm what we saw in our visual analysis. The stars are correct in the center and on the left, but suddenly increase in size on the right. The same is true of the eccentricity. In the center and on the left, the eccentricity is similar throughout with very small oscillations. But towards the right, the stars elongate, especially in the corners. There is another script that can help us to optimize our observations. It calculates the optimum exposure for our observation site, equipment, and filters. Here we have three images of the Andromeda galaxy in H-alpha, one taken when there was a new moon, one with a first quarter moon, and another with a full moon. We're going to calculate how much exposure we need in each one. These measurements should be done with uncalibrated images because all optical systems have some vignetting. The center is always brighter than the periphery, so the exposure required for the center is not the same as that required for a corner. If we apply a flat to this image, the difference in brightness will be cancelled out, so we won't be able to calculate the real exposure we need. To calculate this exposure, we need to go to the Instrumentation section and execute the Calculate Sky Limited Exposure script. Here we need to input various pieces of data. One of them, the pedestal, we don't know yet. As we haven't calibrated the image yet, the bias hasn't been subtracted, so the image has a pedestal. We're going to measure this pedestal now. 
In the case of this camera, we can find it out directly from the images because we're also reading the overscan areas, which we can see down here. And on the left, these overscan areas contain the bias because the pixels are blind to light. But if we don't have any overscan areas, we can use a reference bias. How do we find the pedestal? We go to Statistics, turn on Track View, and we take the median bias value. If we uncheck scientific notation, we can see that it is 0 0.00169. But the script needs it in 16 bits, which gives us a value of 111. This is the value we need for the script. Let's open the script window again, and now we can input the camera information. This camera is a 16-bit camera. The gain is 0.33 electrons per ADU. The readout noise is 1.68. The exposure is 600 seconds. And the pedestal is 111. We get the gain and the readout noise from the camera specifications. This is very important when working with CMOS cameras, as these two values will vary according to the amplifier level we specify. In this case, we selected the optimal gain level to reduce the readout noise without reducing the dynamic range too much. Now we're going to select the two previews in the image with the new moon. The one in the center is preview 2. For the brightness in the center of the image, we can see that we need 5 minutes of exposure. But for the periphery, we need 5 minutes and 50 seconds of exposure. As the lunar cycle progresses, the exposure we need decreases. This is because although we're using a narrowband filter, the light from the moon also gets into the filter's transmission band. With the first quarter moon, we need 3 minutes and 40 seconds. And with a full moon, 3 minutes and 14 seconds. This can vary depending on a lot of factors, like the height of the object above the horizon, how far away the moon is, or the presence of aerosols in the atmosphere, but it gives us a good general idea of the exposure we need with the equipment we're using. Because an exposure time of 5 minutes is quite different from the 30 or 40 minutes we would need with a classic CCD.